I'll give you one minute to do that. We don't want to experience any turbulence. So I plead with you, please, if you have not yet put your phones on flight mode, you have one minute to do that. And by the way, this one minute is not taken from the time I have to preach. So one minute to put your cell phones on flight mode. Before we take off, I invite you to bow your heads with me. Father, you please have mercy upon me, Father. And may you have mercy upon those who have come today, not to listen to a man. Have mercy upon them too. May every demon be bound in Jesus' name. This is my humble prayer, Father. Amen. The title of the message is Neology. Sometimes my pointer plays tricks on me. The title of the sermon is Neology. There was a preacher who once said, There is no theology without neology. Neology is just a fancy word for prayer. That it does not matter how many scriptures, how many verses we have memorized. But if we have all those verses and we do not apply them, then that theology will not save us. It is not enough just to know about God. But we have to submit to God. And we have to receive strength from God to be obedient and to apply His Word. In the beginning, we were with God. Sin separated us from God. And Jesus Christ has come to reunite us or to bring us, restore us back to God. The devil said, that it was impossible for human beings to be obedient to God. He said it was impossible for us to be faithful, for us to keep the law. Jesus placed aside his divinity and he came as a human being, lived on earth, faced everything we face, and Jesus overcame. How did Jesus overcome? What is prayer? I think I'll need your help. Neology is the relentless pursuit for God himself, not blessings. One of the ways that Jesus is using to restore us back to him, it is through prayer. To spend time with him. We, Jesus does not invite us to come as we are so that we should remain as we are. We are to come as we are so that he can impart his righteousness to us. And if we do not spend time with God, we cannot be transformed into his likeness. If we do not spend time with God, we cannot receive that righteousness. We cannot receive power to apply his word. One morning I got up, I prayed, I was tired of evil. I was tired of seeing the world the way it is. And so I prayed. And I said, Father, first of all, begin with me. Change me, transform me. I am not coming because I'm seeking blessings. I am not coming because I want something from you. I am coming to you this morning because I want you. I want to know you. I want to spend time with you. I left that morning and I said, Father, use me to share Christ with somebody. Me and my brother were going to Paseo. And as we were waiting for the jeepney, 
They were fixing or straightening the road in putting Kahoy. And usually when they do this, if you've watched them, they have this, this machine where they, they look into, I don't know what they look for, but this man was doing that. And as I looked at him, I, I, I always wanted to look into one of those things just to see what they see. So I got closer to him and I asked him if I could take a look. So I did. And I began to see what he was seeing. And after a while, he asked me, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I'm a Christian. What denomination? I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. He said, me too. I'm also a Seventh-day Adventist. And after a while, he began to cry. He began to weep. This was out on the streets. And I looked at him as he was crying. I could not, I, I was shocked. And I kept asking myself, why is he crying? And we began to talk. I've just been signaled that this is not working. As we began to talk, he told me that he had been going to church for a long time. He told me he knew the Bible. He knew what was right and he knew what was wrong. But he could not apply the word in his life. Whenever he faced difficulties and temptations, he easily gave in. And he was weeping and weeping. And I invited him to pray. He told me he had some friends. And those friends liked to drink. And he, he never wanted to do those things. When he was alone, he would say to himself, I will not drink. I will not smoke. But when those friends came around, he could not resist. I told him that Paul says that bad company corrupts good morals. And that you cannot be faithful without maintaining a connection with God. I need you to help me. Could you proceed, please? I have not come here to preach a powerful sermon. We have come here to be transformed into a powerful sermon. Can you proceed? Matthew 18 verse 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am where? I am in the midst of them. Could you tap once more? Thank you. Jesus does not say that where two or three are gathered together, I am there. What Jesus says is where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. When we come to church to worship God, when God is our focus, when our attention is to God, when God is our motive, when we leave our rooms and our house, coming to this place and expecting a divine encounter with God himself. Once I was speaking at a dorm, and I like to ask questions when I preached, and I asked a couple of them, why do you come to worship? What brings you to this place? Some of them were bold enough to tell me, Brother, we come for attendance. You see, if we don't come, we will not have gate pass. Some do not even know why they come. But Jesus here says that where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. God longs and God desires so much to dwell with us. The problem is not with God. The problem is with us. The problem is in our motives and our intentions. We do not come to God because we want him. We come to God because of what he can give us. Please, help me proceed. The key to revival is God himself. It is not in the preacher. It is not in the voice of the preacher. It is not in the presentation or the PowerPoint, but the key to revival is God himself. When I discovered this, I was discouraged to preach. And what I want to do is pray. The key to revival is not in the preacher, 
but it is in God himself. When we come in God's name, when we come to seek him, God will dwell amongst us. And where God is, there is revival. Please. Could you proceed? Thank you. Luke chapter 6 verse 12 says that in those days, Jesus went up to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Jesus' purpose for going to pray in the mountains was to be with God. The verse says he went up to the mountain to pray to God. He went there to spend time with God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is one with the Father. Philippians and Colossians says that in him, through him, and for him were all things created. And John chapter 1 says that he was in the beginning with God, and that the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The person who died for you was no ordinary man. This was the Son of God. And Jesus came to show us how we are to survive in this world. As I said in the beginning, the devil said it was impossible for man to be faithful to God, for humans. So Jesus placed his divinity aside. He took upon human flesh. He came down on earth, the Son of God. And Luke 6, 12 says that he spent the whole night in prayer to God, communing with God, spending time with God. If you proceed in Luke chapter 21, verse 37, the Bible says that in daytime, Jesus would be in the temple teaching. And in the evening, he would be in the mountain praying, the mountain called Olivet, in the mountain of Olives. Jesus in daytime would be teaching, preaching, healing, and resurrecting the dead. But in, at nighttime, early in the morning, he would go and spend time with God. There was a time the disciples were facing a storm. They tried to save themselves, but they could not. The Bible says they gave up, and suddenly they saw someone walking on the waters. And as Jesus came, Peter asked to walk in the water also. Jesus allowed him. He took his eyes off Jesus, so he fell. And as he was about to die, he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus pulled him out and walked with him in the boat. And the, and, and the storm ceased, and they were amazed, and they were perplexed. In Luke, it says that when Jesus taught, people marveled at the gracious words that proceeded forth from his lips. And they said, he teaches differently from the Pharisees, for he teaches with authority. And in John, they said, how does this man know letters without learning? Once there was a man who was dead, Lazarus. And they thought that there was no more hope. And Jesus showed up when he was dead. And by the way, Jesus waited for him to die. And when Jesus got there, they told him, listen, he has been dead for a long time. In other words, you are late. There is nothing that you can do. The situation is too bad. The condition is impossible. He has been dead for days. The Bible says that Jesus stood before the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. The reason why Jesus had to mention his name and say, Lazarus, come forth, was if Jesus simply said, come forth, all of the dead would have come forth. And people marveled, how can a man do this? There was a time they crossed the sea of Gennesaret and there was a man who was demon possessed. The Bible says that he used to walk around naked, cutting himself with stones. They had bound him with fetters and he would break them. And when the disciples and Jesus approached the place where he was, that he came running towards them naked, wounded and shouting. And as the disciples saw him coming, they turned and they ran away. But after running for a while, they noticed that someone was missing. And as they turned around, they noticed that Jesus was not running with them. 
And so they tried to see where Jesus was. And they saw that Jesus was standing at the same spot. He did not move a little. The Bible says they came back. He was fearless. He did things that people marveled. The sick came to him and he healed them. He gave sight to the blind. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights without food. And the devil came to him and told him, turn this stone into bread. But Jesus was faithful. The question is, how did he do it? Can you please proceed? The more you pray, the less you go astray. Jesus maintained a connection with the Father. And every time he faced a difficulty, every time there was a trial, there was a problem, he was prepared to overcome them. Please. Luke 22 verse 31, Jesus sitting with the disciples during the Last Supper. He says to Peter, Simon, Simon, the devil wishes to sift you like wheat. And in verse 32, Jesus says, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail you. And when you become converted, strengthen your brethren. Jesus saw the trial that was coming for him. Jesus saw the trial that was coming for all the disciples and for Peter. And Jesus said, the devil wishes to sift you like wheat. The devil wishes to destroy you. And that is his desire for every person in this room. But Jesus tells him, do not worry, for I have prayed for you. Jesus did not say that I will prevent the devil from coming to you. Instead, he tells Peter, I am giving you something that will lead you through that problem. Jesus did not say, I'm going to remove the devil so that he may no longer destroy you. Jesus was telling Peter, I will give you strength to bear this difficulty, this trial. Ellen White says that as they approached the garden, after Jesus said these words, Jesus took them to go and pray. The disciples had marked the change that came over their master. Never before had they seen him so utterly sad and silent. As they proceeded, this strange sadness deepened. Yet they dared not question him as to the cause. Every step that he, this is Jesus, now took was with labored effort. He groaned aloud as if suffering under the pressure of a terrible burden. Twice his companions supported him or he would have fallen to the earth. As they were going to the garden, Jesus felt so much pain, agony, and burden that he could not walk. He, he was even about to fall twice, but the disciples had to help him on his feet. Could you proceed? She goes on to say the guilt of fallen humanity he was he must bear. So dreadful does this does sin appear to him. So great is the weight of guilt which he must bear that he is tempted to fear. It was shut it will shut him out forever from his father's love. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God against transgression. He exclaims, this is Jesus, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. As they went to the garden in verse 40, Jesus said to the disciples, pray that you may not fall into temptation. You see, when Jesus told them that he was going to have to die, and that they were going to take him. Peter said, I will stand for you. I am even ready to go to prison with you. I will not betray you. Jesus does not tell him anything yet. But Jesus takes them to the mountain. And in verse 40, Jesus tells them, pray. Peter said, I will stand for you. I will be faithful in the midst of of all these trials. When they come to take you, I will not abandon you. 
Jesus takes him to the garden, saying to him, Peter, if you want to stand like me, you have to kneel like me. And Jesus told them, pray, pray with me. The Bible says that Jesus walked the stones throw away and he fell down to the ground. And he began to pray and he said, Father, if it be your will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. She mentions that Jesus was in so much pain. That Jesus felt, and if you continue to read, please help me. She mentions that heaven, they saw their Lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces. As Jesus was on that, in that garden, and as he fell to the ground, feeling that pain and agony, there were legions of angels around him, of demons. And the devil was discouraging him. Could you proceed? Again. And she says, Satan pressed the situation upon the Redeemer. The people, this is what the devil was telling him. The people who claim to be above all others in temporal and spiritual advantages have rejected you. Those who boast they have the sanctuary. Those who boast they have the Sabbath. Those who boast they know the true doctrines and they are the remnant. They have rejected you. She goes on to say that the devil said they are seeking to destroy you. The foundation, the center and seal of the promise made to them as a peculiar people. One of your own disciples who has listened to your instructions and has been among the foremost in church activities will betray you. One of your most zealous followers will deny you. All will forsake you. Christ's whole being abhorred the thought that those whom he had undertaken to save, those whom he had loved so much, should unite in the plots of Satan. This pierced his soul. The conflict was terrible. Jesus was in deep agony. The devil was telling him, it's not possible. They are going to betray you. Those whom you love, they have denied you. And if you die, you will not come back. And many times, and in these last days, the devil tells us that revival is not possible. That people have gone too far. There is no way out. You might as well commit suicide. It is impossible. Please. In Luke 22, verse 43, the Bible says that an angel appeared to him and strengthened him. Could you tap once more? Ellen White mentions, in the supreme crisis, when heart and soul are breaking under the load of sin, Gabriel is sent to strengthen the divine sufferer and brace him to tread his blood-stained path. Sometimes when we face trials and difficulties, we ask God to remove them. We ask God to take them from our lives. Jesus did not ask God to remove it. He said, Father, if it be your will, if it be your will, take it. But if it is not, then let your will be done. God did not send Gabriel to discourage Jesus. He did not send Gabriel to remove Jesus from earth and take him to heaven so that he does not have to face what he had to face. Instead, God sent Gabriel to encourage Jesus to go through the difficulties. God will not remove those difficulties. What God wants to do in our lives is to give us strength to endure those difficulties. But in order for us to receive that strength, we have to be spending time with God. We have to be communing with God. And this is what Jesus did to survive. The angel came to him when he was praying. He spent nights in prayer. He placed his divinity aside 
And he depended upon God showing to us and proving to us that it is possible as long as we remain connected with God. Could you please proceed? Luke verse 22, chapter 22 verse 44 says that he, his agony increased. And it says that he continued to pray more earnestly and that his, his sweat became blood. Could you proceed? It was in the power of Christ to deliver himself. Jesus could have used his divinity to save himself. But he knew that Ayas would need him. He knew that I needed him. He knew that I needed to see that it was possible for us humans to remain faithful during storms. And so Jesus proceeded and asked God for strength. My time is up. I plead for five more minutes. Is that okay with you? Please help me here. In order to stand like Jesus, you must kneel like Jesus. You can not stand in this world with your own strength. Jesus, the Son of God. Let me tell you something. If Jesus did not pray that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, the way he did, my dear friends, Jesus would not have made it through that night. Because he had placed his divinity aside. He relied wholly upon the Lord. How much more for you and for me? We cannot stand. 